Tony Siebel, let's hear it. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you, Schneider, for sponsoring the event. I appreciate that. Um, so thank you for being here. Thanks for the invite. Um, before I take you into the future, though, I'm going to take you into the past. Because there's always something to be learned about history. Can you all see this? Yes? yes? Where is the car? Can anyone tell me this is a picture from New York City, Fifth Avenue, um, Easter 1900? Where is the car? All right. I won't keep you waiting. I know some of you are um, hungry. There. One car. This is 13 years later, same place in New York, Fifth Avenue, Easter Parade. Where is the horse? Where is the horse? Come up, check it out. So here is disruption at work. And this is not the first time that we're going through a disruption. Society, industry has gone through many, many, many disruptions uh, in the past. And this was one of the major disruptions in transportation. And to go from all horse to all cars took about 13 years. And that's history. And we can learn from that. Now, let me define disruption. Um, but before that, let me tell you, there are three major concurrent disruptions that are going to change everything about energy and transportation over the next 15 years. By 2030, transportation and energy will be nothing like what we have today. But what does disruption mean? Because you know we use, we bandy this word around a lot. What is disruption? Let, let me quickly uh, uh, define it. Disruption, a disruptive product, is when a new product or service basically creates a market. So EVs have started to create a market. But at the same time, it destroys an old market. It can transform it radically or destroy that market. That is a disruptive uh, product or innovation. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, as some of you know, Kodak was the number one company in photography, or should I say the company formerly known as Kodak. And so that's one of the disruptions that we have uh, seen over the last uh, decade. And usually, it's, there's something interesting about disruption. It's usually the experts and the insiders who basically say, nah, never going to happen. Not in this lifetime. No way. It's going to take 100 years, you know? Good boy. Go home, right? <laughs> um, but there are some technologies that, that that basically will show you, and that's what I'm going to do today, that are disruptive. Um, and I'm going to start with the electric vehicle. It's one of the three things I'm going to talk about today, the electric vehicle. And some of you have already started talking about it, and there are some EVs outside. Um, and so you probably know that the 2013 car, motor trend car of the year, was the Tesla Model S. Um, this is not the EV of the year or the alternative car of the year. This is the car of the year. Consumer Reports said that the Tesla Model S was the best car they have ever tested, ever, ever in history. And already the Tesla Model S 
is the number one um, uh, selling car in its category, 70,000 plus luxury vehicle. Um, so basically a car that did not exist 10 years ago is outselling BMW, Mercedes, and, and Audi, and so on and so forth in that category. Um, of course, there's the minor detail that some of you may be asking, who can afford an electric vehicle? Now, that's not mine. I, I actually don't own a car. Um, that's a photo op. Uh, but, but, but my question is, is the EV disruptive uh, at any price? Is the EV disruptive? Um, in the book, in the Clean Disruption, I give you um, nine reasons. I'm going to run quickly through five of them uh, why the electric vehicle is disruptive. One, the electric motor is five times plus more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine vehicle. Your car, those of you who have gasoline cars, turns about 20% of the energy in the gasoline into actual mechanical power, 20%. And there is nothing that Detroit can do about that because there's a minor issue called the loss of thermodynamics that, that, that has an upper limit as to how much can be turned from energy in, in gasoline uh, into actual uh, power. Whereas an electric motor turns 90, 95% of the uh, uh, energy in the battery into, into power. That's one. Two, uh, partly as a result of this, but partly because electricity is cheaper than gasoline, um, the EV is 10x at least cheaper to fuel. The cost to fill up a Tesla Model S, which goes to 160 miles, is five bucks. Five, the, whole, the whole tank, right? Not just a gallon, five bucks. I, I, I want anyone to tell me, when was the last time you filled up for five bucks? Okay, this is 10x at least cheaper than uh, oil cars. Electric vehicles are, it looks like, more than 10x, cheaper to maintain and operate. Now, in disruption, every time you have one 10x improvement in an important dimension, you may have a disruptive product. I have mentioned already three dimensions in which we may have a 10x improvement over the existing um, uh, system. And you may have heard um, that Elon Musk announced a couple of weeks ago, infinite mile warranty. The EV is so cheap to maintain, electric motors last basically forever, basically, uh, and it has so many fewer parts than a gasoline, that internal combustion engine car, that uh, an EV, it takes almost nothing to maintain. So basically, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, said, look, for eight years, infinite mile warranty. I mean, drive to the moon and back many times, within eight years, you're under warranty. Try that, Detroit. <laughs> Four, wireless charging. Now, those of us who are interested in public transportation with electric buses, there are cities already implementing wireless charging. So every time you stop, the bus pulls into a stop, they're charging the bus. And since they're already going through the same routes, day in and day out, they don't have to stop to plug in. So essentially, this doubles the range of electric vehicles, uh, or at least buses where we have those kind of charging stations. Um, and this is a biggie. Um, you know, and, and anyone who's driven a, 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 an EV knows the power, the torque. It just goes, pssst, right? You don't need to go like, 
right? That's the sound in which we're you know, used to driving over basically all our lives. But when you drive an EV, the torque is instant. You start, and that's why an EV is so much more powerful and goes from zero to whatever in, in a couple of seconds, in three, four, five seconds, something that um, only the most powerful cars do. Um, again, um, Tesla, Elon Musk said, our next SUV will have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera. Now, this is going to be a $40,000 SUV. So all of these things that I'm telling you are essentially disrupting the basis of competition. So for 100 years, the um, car industry got us used to this curve. You want more power, more performance, you pay more. You want the Porsche 911 Carrera? You pay the hundred grand. You want the um, the Buick Enclave, which was the number one SUV in its category, forty thousand dollars. Then you pay less. Of course, you get half the performance, and that more or less is the curve that we got used to, basically in our lifetime. What the electric vehicle is doing is this: it's shifting that curve so that you can get the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera in a $40,000 SUV. Not today. And the issue is, when are we going to get there? But what I wanted to mention is, is this thing disruptive? And it's very, very disruptive. So yes, it's disruptive. The question is, when is this thing going to happen? When is the disruption going to happen? So um, I took a look at, so we need uh, the infrastructure to make this happen. Um, and uh, the main issue, one of the two main issues holding back uh, electric vehicle adoption is the cost of batteries. And I've done the numbers. I've looked at the industry. And I think that you need a 200 mile minimum range for EVs to go mainstream, 200 miles. So based on current prices in the market for uh, lithium ion batteries uh, and based on 200 mile ranges, then this is what we get. Um, oh, but before that, let me tell you, because uh, I don't want to guess. I'm going to give you the numbers, the actual data, the evidence from the market. For 15 years, the cost of lithium ion batteries went down by 14% per year. So those of you who have laptops, and I see a lot of them open, uh, the cost of, of those uh, uh, batteries, which, by the way, is what Teslas are using, slightly modified lithium-ion batteries, went down 14%. We expect it to go down at least 14% per year for the foreseeable future. Um, but it actually is, is, is getting better because in the past, only the information technology industry, the electronics industry, used to invest in lithium-ion batteries. But now, there are three multi-trillion dollar industries investing in batteries. IT, of course, um, the auto industry, and the energy industry, the solar, wind, and so on of this world. So you have three multi-trillion dollar industries investing tripling the investment, tripling the, the demand, and so on and so forth. So as a result, the curve, the, the drop in battery costs is actually accelerating. So over the last four years, it went from 14% to 16%. And actually, Tesla is way ahead of this curve, by the way. But as an industry, it went down 16%. Um, and you may have heard about this little factory that Tesla is building. And by the way, I'm using Tesla as an example, not 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 because I'm endorsing them or own stock or anything like that. Um, Tesla is building a $5 billion battery factory in Nevada um, that single-handedly will double the world's lithium-ion battery capacity. This one factory. 
just because it's being built, the cost of lithium ion batteries is gonna go down another 30%. And that does not include breakthroughs that happen at that factory, um, or because others, a competition, are gonna build their own versions. So, um, so here's where we are, uh, 200 mile car, electric vehicle, like the Model S, uh, costs seventy seventy five thousand dollars $75,000. But if we do the cost curve of lithium ion battery, which is the main uh, uh, cost item of an EV, then this is what we get. By 2018, 2017, 2018, the industry will be able to build a $40,000 electric SUV that goes to 100 miles. Not just Tesla, the industry. Now, did I mention that these are SUVs that have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera? So when these SUVs with this performance hit the market, boom, there's going to be no way that the equivalent price gasoline vehicle is going to sell. I mean, that's disruption at work. Um, by two years later, by 2020, the industry will be able to build a $31,000 EV. $31,000 is the average price of a gasoline car in America. So by 2020, the industry will be able to beat the average manufactured gasoline car in America. And two, three years later, they will be able to build the low-end car, which today costs $21,000. So within eight years, and maybe if it takes a little more time to build out the infrastructure and some people are going to make mistakes and so on, within eight years, by 2022, 2023, the industry, the electric vehicle industry, will be able to disrupt the gasoline car industry. Now, we usually uh, own our cars for, for 10 years, so there's, there's gonna be this uh, displacement of older uh, vehicles. So by 2030, this, these are my predictions based on these numbers. Um, the mass migration from internal combustion engine gasoline vehicles um, to, uh, from gasoline cars will be starting within the next three years, by 2017, 2018. Um, by 2030, all, all mainstream cars will be electric. 100% of all mainstream cars by 2030 will be electric. And by extension, gasoline will be obsolete. Now, we're not done. We're not, but wait, there's more. Um, the autonomous car, you may have heard about the self-driving car um, that has come out of uh, Google and Nissan and other companies. Um, recently, the CEO of Nissan announced that they will go to market with a self-driving car, fully self-driving car by 2018. That's four years from now. And a lot of people are shocked that how did this happen, right? And what is going to be the result of all these self-driving cars? But, you know, the truth is that we already have semi-autonomous, we also call them autonomous vehicles, uh, in the market. Essentially, all high-end cars today from Audi and BMW and Mercedes and so on, um, have self-driving self capabilities, nearly all of them. And in fact, they have been migrating to the medium and the low end. Um, so this is something that has been happening already. Parks that drive themselves, park that, uh, that, that I mean that park, self-park, or, or that maintain a certain distance between cars, or actually will break if, if you're not paying attention. 
the, I think the Class C, the Mercedes Class C, already is self-driving on the highways, already. Okay, so this is something that has been happening for a while. It's, it's not a binary uh, zero, non-zero. Um, the NHTSA, the, the, the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency, has a five-level matrix from zero to four, basically saying, okay, you're a level zero if you have a car that the human is the driver all the time, 100%. And you have a one, and you have a two, and you have a three. And basically, you have a four when you have a fully autonomous, fully self-driving car where, where you don't need steering wheels, you don't need a human, you don't need basically uh, a person, period, right? Um, and look at where we are. We already have cars in levels zero, one, two, and three uh, in the market at Stanford. We are in conversations with one of these companies um, to have a self-driving shuttle to go around the campus. Because those of you who have been there, you know how large Stanford is. You just can't walk from one place to another. We have shuttles today, but we're already in conversations. We may have a self-driving shuttle at Stanford on the Stanford campus next year. Okay, these things are happening, and they're happening as we speak. It's, it's not in the future, it's now. Now, let's talk about price, because you know, these things must be pricey, right? Um, and this is, this is what a Google car sees. It's pretty uh, fascinating to look at uh, how the, uh, the, the, this technology is called LiDAR, which is short for uh, laser and radar, LiDAR. And, when Google disclosed its prices uh, in 2012, LiDAR cost $70,000. Two years later, it was $10,000. I know a company, I know an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley who claims to be building one with the same functional capabilities for $1,000. So basically, the exponential decrease in costs so far, I've told you about the, the lithium ion batteries, uh, LiDAR, and so on and so forth. Think of the electric vehicle and the self-driving cars as computers on wheels, as tablets on wheels. They are progressing, they are getting better so fast that they're getting better at the speed of Moore's law, which is at the speed of the computers that you own. Um, so it's no uh, uh, surprise that, that companies like, like Tesla that, that have started to dominate this, this field came out of Silicon Valley. Um, and the, 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 they see themselves more like Apple than GM or Ford. It takes a whole different set of technologies. You have to write software and hardware and, and computing and, and so on and so forth, and you have to keep revving um, pretty much products all the time. Um, so again, it's no surprise that the self-driving car, this one came out of Google, a computer company. Um, so the, 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 the car companies that actually want to live through this disruption have to get into this right now or otherwise Wait until I tell you something else. The other question is, will users be ready for this? Cisco Systems did a survey, and this is the result. Depending on the country, 95% of Brazilians say, I will use a self-driving car right now. Right now. It's not even in the market. China. India, US, 60% of the market is ready to get into a self-driving car. Another part of this survey said, would you put your kid in a self-driving car and send, send her off to, uh, to school? And the numbers were pretty similar. So people are pretty ready for this kind of um, car. Now, here's another disruption that is gonna come out 
uh, and those of you who are in, in urban design and architecture and landscaping, um, we're really not good drivers. People ask me, can I trust a self-driving car? Well, test driving cars already are better drivers than you are, <laughs> period. Sorry, they're better drivers than I am. Uh, Stanford is working on um, a self-driving car that learns from Formula One drivers. So we're beyond us. I mean, we're talking Formula One drivers to see their reaction and how they handle the car and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and they're pretty uh, accurate in terms of the software that, that self-drives. All those highways that we complain about, and those of you who live in the LA metro area who spend hours and hours every day in traffic, we actually don't use 95% of the highways. We don't. That's because we're not great drivers. We leave too much space. We don't accelerate when we have to. We're like eating and putting makeup on and talking to the kids. And some people text and drive. Um, so in fact, we're not really great drivers. Um, and technology helps a lot with this. If all cars had adaptive cruise control, which is one of the many autonomous vehicle uh, technologies, we would have 40% better use of highways. So essentially, if all cars had ACC, that's almost like doubling the highway space out there. Um, so I was talking about ACC. If you have ACC plus in our vehicle communications, those two technologies alone boost highway capacity by 273%. So anyone who's talking now about increasing highway capacity, about building more highways, all of those highways are going to be empty. OK? All of them. Because when we have an all autonomous vehicle uh, 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 market, that in and of itself will increase highway capacity by 4x. By 4x. Now, here's another interesting fact. We pay a ton of money for our cars. I don't care what car you have. Average is $31,000 to park them 96% of the time. What a waste. What a waste. 31 grand or whatever plus gasoline and this and that to park it 96% of the time. OK? Free parking is very expensive. It's very expensive. Now, here's what's going to happen when we have self-driving cars. Now, you know companies like Uber and Lyft and so on that come pick you up. You, you basically uh, click on your smartphone, someone comes up, pick you up, and boom, takes you to, to your destination. Imagine those kind of software uh, uh, infrastructures with self-driving cars. Basically, they can take you from anywhere to anywhere, anytime, anytime, right? You could go at a bar, you could go to school, you could go to work, drop you off, and then go off to pick up somebody else. So what's going to happen is that cars, instead of being parked 90% of the time, they're going to be driving 90% of the time. Essentially, we're not going to need cars. What we need from a car is mobility on demand at a fair price. And by the evidence, early evidence, looks like on a per mile basis, we're going to pay 10x less for this kind of service, car on demand, uh, so self-driving car plus on demand. So we're not going to need to own a car. This is called car as a service, or at least I call it that. And remember 15 years ago when we talked about software as a service, that everything would be on the cloud? Folks, folks would say, me? Use software as a service? I don't think so. And now, of course, most of the industry is as a service. Um, so, conclusion. If 
we have a car as a service society, we're not going to need 80% of the cars that we have now. So the industry, the car industry, is going to go from selling 100 million cars a year to selling 20 million cars a year. So the auto industry will be massively disrupted. So disruption number one, we're going to go all electric. This number, disruption number two, we're going to go all autonomous, and the industry is going to shrink. Okay. No need for 80% of parking spaces. Imagine that. I mean, the whole downtown can be parking space free. Imagine what we can do with all that space. Green parking. No, parks, right? Green parks, not parking. Imagine what we can do. More density, more wealth, more health. And that is going to happen. Helsinki in Finland is already planning for its downtown a car as a service and transportation as a service, not just car. Ferries, buses, bikes, everything as a service where you can call it from your uh, smartphone by 2025. That's only 11 years away. So they're betting that this thing is going to happen, and it's not really a bet. We already have most of the technologies. Um, so conclusions from the self-driving car. Um, one is that car as a service will change the concept of car ownership. We're not going to need to own cars. Maybe one or two people will, but as a society, we're not going to need to own cars. Two. The new market, the new car market will shrink by 80%, period. It's going to shrink because we're going to need fewer cars, which means the car insurance industry is going to be obsolete or at least disrupted. Oil, again, is going to be disrupted. So even if you don't believe the electric vehicle thing, the car market is going to shrink by 80%. So oil is going to be hit twice with two waves of disruption. Um, and, of course, the auto industry, the whole transportation industry will be disrupted. Um, and we're not going to need 80% of the highway space and the parking space out there. Almost a third of the L.A. metro area, according to some figures I've seen, is parking. A third. We're going to get most of that back. Imagine what we're going to do with that. 80% of parking and highway space will be useless. Now, let me tell you quickly about the solar disruption. Solar PV, again, another disruption. Solar photovoltaic, solar panels, have gone down in price by 154 times since 1970. 154 times. Now, compare that with... So, yeah, um, and as partly as a result of, of that, the market for solar has gone up 100 times. So when you have an exponentially decreasing cost and an exponentially increasing market, you usually get a disruptive kind of uh, 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 innovation and, and disruption in the market. Um, so quick numbers. If So solar basically since 2000 has been growing at 43% per year. Despite all the media stuff that you hear about crisis in solar, it's been growing worldwide by 43% per year since the year 2000. Okay, now, if you keep that growth going, it essentially means that by 2030, all the world's energy, not just electricity, all of the world's energy will be solar by 2030. So, of course, you have to ask yourself, can we keep up with that 43% uh, uh, annual growth? So, and, and, that, and that's a question that we need to ask, of course. So, let's compare uh, solar PV, which always goes down because it's a technology disruption with resource-based energy. 
And when you look at coal, nuclear, natural gas, and oil, since 1970, which is the baseline that I've used, they've all gone up by anywhere from six times to 35 times. Oil has gone up 35 times since 1970, right? Um, all of them go up. Now, there's been a dip in natural gas and all that stuff, but look at the numbers. When you compare how solar has done relative to these four forms of energy. Since 1970, solar has improved it, its cost position by 5,000 times relative to oil. 5,000 times. I mean, if you're sitting there in an oil well somewhere and you're looking at this, you think you should be worried? I mean, it's, it's improved its cost position by 1,500 times relative to nukes. And that doesn't include all the massive subsidies that nuclear uh, uh, gets, right? Um, so with the low prices of natural gas with fracking and all that stuff, even including that, since 1970, solar PV has improved unit costs by 2,200 times relative to natural gas. 2,200 times relative to natural gas. Is natural gas cheap? And so this is what's happening, and this is happening everywhere in the world. Now, there are different markets with different prices. I mean, the US alone has 3,000 um, electricity markets. Um, and there are different tax bases and monopolies and so on and so forth. But this curve, in one way, one shape or another, is happening in every single place in the world. Solar goes down and all the other energy costs go up. That's been happening since 1970, right? I mean, I, I, I put out all the data out there. And solar will continue to go down. The solar learning curve is 22%, meaning every time the infrastructure doubles, it goes down 22%. And it has done so since 1970. And we know it's going to keep going down. It's a little bit like Moore's law in, in, in computers. So it's going to go down by another two thirds by 2020. Solar will continue to go down. In fact, solar is so cheap right now that when you talk to solar installers, all the other costs, costs other than panel, are way higher than solar panels. Solar panels now are relatively cheap compared to permitting and compared to uh, uh, installation costs uh, and so on and so forth. Okay? So by 2020, even assuming that all the other resource uh, energy forms don't go um, up, which they will, um, solar will have improved its cost position relative to oil by 16,000 times. 16,000 times. Relative to natural gas, by 6,800 times. Okay, reminder. Solar PV will have improved its unit costs by 6,800 times relative to natural gas by 2020. So any promises of the natural gas millennium that's coming, just take a look at these numbers. And of course, 16,000 times relative to oil. So the rate of growth in solar may actually accelerate 43% was just the beginning. I mean, just like the internet accelerated while I was an early employee at Cisco Systems, the internet growth accelerated and folks said, wait, but you're starting from a small base. Yeah, everything starts from a small base, okay? So, but even if it doesn't accelerate, here's what we're looking at. By 2030, essentially, if we keep going at at least this growth rate, everything. Solar will eat everything. So the clean disruption 
means that will be 100% vehicles, most of them will be autonomous or semi-autonomous at least, and 100% solar by 2030, maybe before. Thank you.